Hello, and thank you so much for inviting me to present to you all um, at this conference focused on rare diseases. I'm going to be talking today about developmental trajectories and behavioral concerns that are seen in patients with Angelman syndrome. So just an overview of what I would like to talk about today. Um, first, I'd like to just do a brief introduction to let you get to know me a little bit more. Um, and then I'm going to tell you uh, about some data that's been collected from the US and Canada based Angelman syndrome natural history study. And the data I'll be sharing is specifically focused on helping us understand the developmental trajectories of children with Angelman syndrome, as well as address concerns related to behavioral challenges and anxiety. So first, a little introduction. My name is Anne Wheeler. I'm a neurodevelopmental psychologist and a senior scientist at RTI International, which is an international nonprofit research institute. I've been involved in work with Angelman syndrome for well over a decade. I started as a clinician at the Angelman syndrome clinic uh, at the Carolina Institute for Developmental Disabilities, which is a clinic that's affiliated with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Since moving from UNC, where I was on faculty full-time, to RTI, I have become more involved in research focused on Angelman syndrome. I have, however, continued to see patients with Angelman syndrome and DUP15Q syndrome at the CIDD once a month. At RTI, I lead the Ladder Database, which is an effort to try to bring together data sets on patients with Angelman syndrome from around the country and hopefully soon around the world in order to help maximize the ability to answer important research questions about the condition. The team that I lead at RTI also provides statistical support to the Angelman syndrome natural history study, which I'll be talking about a little bit today. In addition, I am involved in an effort to try to bring newborn screening to conditions that are typically not screened for at birth through a program called Early Check in North Carolina. This program allows families who are expecting a new baby to uh, enroll that child in our study, to have them screened for conditions that are normally not screened for in the newborn screen, newborn phase. <clears throat> we are currently working on adding Angelman syndrome to our Early Check panel. As a way of supporting families who receive a diagnosis through early check, we have developed an early intervention program called PIXI, which stands for Parents and Infants Interaction Intervention. And PIXI provides a year-long family support and early developmental strategy program for parents who have received a diagnosis of a neurogenetic condition in their newborn. PIXI allows the family to have a slower process in terms of learning about the condition over the course of the year and provides support to parents who may be struggling with the diagnosis, as well as provide strategies for emerging symptoms as they start to occur. So I'm not going to talk about all these other programs right now. I'm going to focus specifically on the study that we have done in the States um, focused on natural history. So this study has been in place since 2004 and it's a mixture of a review of retrospective review from parents about things that have happened to their child in the course of their lifetime including their medical history and then we also do prospective data collection so an annual visit with the research team where we collect uh, updated information on medical history we do some parent report outcome measures, um, asking about behavior and development and medical concerns, um, seizures, sleep, etc. And then we also do direct assessments with the individual with Angelman syndrome. This allows us to understand medical complications that may occur over time and at certain ages. It helps us to really understand when children with Angelman syndrome meet developmental milestones and achieve skills that they might need for functional daily living. It also includes an EEG to allow us to understand brain function over time. These visits are conducted once a year um, at one of many study sites across the country, and it includes all ages. So we see children from as young as birth all the way through 60 years of age and beyond. So as of today, the natural history study has collected data on, uh, actually this number is a little outdated, it's closer to 500 children um, or individuals with Angelman syndrome, the majority of whom have the deletion subtype, 
but you can see we have uh, representation from all, all molecular subtypes uh, of Angelman syndrome in our study. So the information I'm going to provide to you going forward is all data that's come from the natural history study. So we have looked at developmental milestones over time and developmental growth. And this has been using primarily the Bailey, develop Bailey scales of infant and toddler development, which is administered again annually to the kids. And it, just some highlighted findings from our developmental assessments. Uh, it appears that across all, all subtypes, molecular subtypes, children with Angelman syndrome makes slow but steady developmental growth over time. We do see that children with non-deletion subtypes do tend to score higher on these scales and they have more rapid growth. So they tend to grow, uh, to gain skills at a rate that's closer to typical development than children with deletion subtypes. The most impaired domains within development are expressive communication, which we all can understand and relate to, as well as gross motor skills. In contrast, social skills tend to be a relative strength and those skills tend to increase over time. We also ask families to report on behavioral concerns that they've observed in their individual with Angelman syndrome. And here are some of the data that we have from that. So nearly all individuals across all subtypes were reported to be easily excitable. So anywhere between seven, uh, 70 and 91% of uh, participants were reported to be easily excitable. Um, having a short attention span, some hand flapping and hyperactivity were all reported at a high rate across the samples. Um, aggressive behavior is also reported, although the types of aggressive behavior varies uh, ac across the subtypes. So you can see here that we see um, biting occurring more often in the non-deletion subtypes than in deletion subtypes, whereas hair pulling is a, a bit more uh, common in deletion and UPD than it is in the UP3, UB3A mutation subtype. And pinching tends to occur most commonly in UPD or imprinting defect subtypes. Anxiety, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, is also somewhat common, although less so than the excitability and attention span um, and aggressive behaviors. And anxiety does seem to be occurring more frequently in UPD and imprinting defect um, subtype than in UB3A or deletion. Temper tantrums um, are also more common in UB3A than in the other subtypes. And these are the differences between subtypes are statistically different for e easily excitable, meaning that the UB3A subtype is less likely to be easily excitable than the other two types in overall behavioral concerns and in anxiety and temper tantrums. <clears throat> Some other behaviors that seem to occur at a relatively frequent rate, uh, throwing objects. This is a behavioral issue that occurs in uh, 90 percent of UPD and 92 percent of imprinting defect um, and it's somewhat less common in UB3A or deletion um, and then about 50 to 60 percent of all subtypes are seen to uh, engage in explosive behavior um, tantrums that include flopping or dropping to the ground and shrieking or hollering over others other behavioral concerns related to sensory issues include tactile defensiveness, which uh, about 30 to 50% of the sample were reported to engage in, um, a bit more so in deletion and UPD than in imprinting defect or UB3A. Also resisting touching of the head um, is, about, is a common in about 41% of those with deletion and about 20 to 40% of the other subtypes. And then resisting any objects being placed on the head was most often reported by those with a deletion, followed by UPD, imprinting defect, and about 50% of those with a UB3A mutation. So a big question for many families is when we see behavioral concerns, what is the likelihood these will continue or change? Um, and so we do have some data on that over time. This is just with two subscales from one measure looking at irritability, which is related to aggressive behavior, as well as hyperactivity. And you can see our deletion kids in the solid line here tend to have lower rates of these behaviors and these behaviors tend to stay pretty consistent over time. So they're not really increasing um, much over time. This is in contrast to uh, the UB3A mutation subtype, which um, has higher rates overall of these behaviors. And these behaviors do tend to be uh, tend to increase as the, as the individual gets older. 
So I want to spend the rest uh, or a good chunk of the rest of this talk talking about anxiety, which is listed as a characteristic of Angelman syndrome with um, about 80% penetrance, meaning that about 80% of individuals with Angelman syndrome are expected to show signs of anxiety. However, what does anxiety look like in Angelman syndrome? It's likely different than what we would call anxiety in a typically developing individual or even in an individual with uh, intellectual disability that isn't quite as severe as individuals with Angelman. So we've asked families and we've uh, taken notes on what we perceive anxiety looking like and that could look like irritability, it could look like agitation, it could be increased restlessness or distractibility, it could be increases in repetitive or ritualistic behaviors, increases in crying or screaming in specific situations, increases in aggression. It could also mean look like somatic issues such as increased sweating, uh, stomach pains or vomiting and shaking. Unfortunately, these observable behaviors may be due to anxiety, but they also could all be attributed to things like neurological concerns such as seizures, pain, gastrointestinal problems, or just frustration with the inability to communicate what they're needing or wanting. Another challenge with being able to describe anxiety in Angelman syndrome is that anxiety is considered an internal disorder, which requires the individual to be able to describe their internal experiences. And as we all know, this is a big challenge for patients with Angelman syndrome in terms of being able to describe what they're experiencing. So that makes understanding and measuring anxiety in this population very challenging. So, in the clinic at UNC, we started to observe um, an interesting phenomenon where we were noticing that patients that came in who are in the older adolescence to young adult age range were showing high rates of anxiety, what looked like a separation anxiety, meaning that they were fine as long as their preferred caregiver was in the, in the space with them and attending to them. But as soon as that preferred caregiver tried to engage with somebody else or tried to leave the room, the individual with Angelman syndrome would become increasingly agitated um, to the point of becoming aggressive. So we decided to see if we could understand more about this phenomenon and understand if it is occurring um, across the board in, in a higher frequency. So we basically sent out a survey that was really not a validated survey, just a survey asking parents to report on their experiences with these um, behavioral concerns and anxiety. And this is what we found. Um, we found that anxiety concerns overall um, were reported at a higher rate in individuals who were older in the adolescent and young adult range. Um, that there did seem to be a peak in late adolescence for having um, a preference for a caregiver and becoming agitated when people came between the them and the caregiver or when they lose the caregiver's attention or even to the point of um, getting agitated when the caregiver stopped looking directly at the individual with Angelman syndrome. And again, this peaked during the late adolescence phase. We also see this more in patients with UB3A than the other subtypes um, with UPD and um, uh, imprint. Imp imprinting defects being um, higher than in the deletion subtype in most cases. So just to speak a little bit about why we think anxiety may be occurring in Angelman syndrome and when it occurs. So we do hear reports and we have done additional data analysis to look at this and um, most, most caregivers report that the times that anxiety seems to incur most is when they're leaving their parents or a preferred caregiver when they're going somewhere new or unexpected, when expectations are out of keeping with their abilities, when they're asked to do something that's too hard for them, when there are many things going on at once and they're overly stimulated, and similarly, when sensory issues are either too high, so there's too many sounds, too many smells, it's too hot, or too low, where they're not getting enough input and so they're seeking the sensory input out from um, their environment. And if we could um, ask the individual with Angelman syndrome to convey what they might be experiencing during this time, we think these are the types of messages they might be trying to say. One might be that I'm getting nervous about my parent not being here and who will take care of me. I get scared when I don't know what to expect and I don't know what to expect next when things are changing. I get stressed when the environment is crowded or no noisy or when things are too difficult for me. And I'm afraid in situations that are associated in the past with pain or discomfort. 
and maybe simply that I just don't like how I feel inside and I want to feel better and I don't know how to let you know. So it's important to keep in mind that all behaviors occur for a reason. There is always a function for an individual's behavior. There are four primary functions that are thought to drive most of the behaviors that we see in individuals with Angelman syndrome. This could be, first of all, potentially to escape something that's unpleasant or too challenging. It could be to get attention or to get other people to be aware of something that they need or want. It could be to communicate something or to get something tangible that like a preferred activity or a preferred item. Or it could be because of sensory needs, either too much sensory input and they want to get away from it or not enough sensory input and they're trying to obtain sensory input. So here are some examples of some behaviors that may be seen and what might be occurring to cause the behavior. An example might be that a new interventionist or a new worker is coming to the house to provide additional support to the individual with Angelman. When the individual saw the worker coming in the house and it was somebody they didn't know, they became very agitated and distressed and make increased vocalizations and started clinging to the caregiver. And so when we think about this particular behavior, we can think about what might the individual with Angelman syndrome be trying to say. And in this situation, it may be that they're trying to say that they don't know this new person and that that's intimidating and scary to them. Another example might be um, when a teacher gets out new material at school and it's a material that the individual isn't familiar with. And the behavior may be that once the material is presented to the individual, they throw it. And what they may be trying to convey to the, to the teacher is that this is too hard and I don't know how to do it and therefore I don't want it. A third example might be um, in when an individual is going to a community outing and they're going to the mall and they're asked to get out of the van and they refuse to move, they freeze. This could be potentially because they're scared of the crowds and noises, they've had an experience at the mall before and they know that it is not something that is comfortable to them. So this is, these are just some examples of some immediate triggers that may cause a behavior and being able to think about what is happening in the fuller context and identifying the functions can help us understand what the individual is trying to say and therefore allow us to come up with some strategies that may help them. So here we can walk through um, another example. So important thing to consider when you see a behavior is when is and when is and what is happening in before. So let's say this example is a teacher asks this child Peter, let's go sit in a circle. And once the teacher says this, Peter immediately starts pulling another child's hair. So these things may not be connected at first in your mind, but when you realize that whenever the teacher asks the child to do something like sit in a circle, they become aggressive. And then when you notice that what happens is that as soon as the child pulls another child's hair, the aide comes and takes Peter out of the room. And so we can look at these things and say, here's, a, here's what's happening before, here's the behavior, and here's what's happening. And based on this, we can say that it looks very likely that Peter is trying to escape, and that is the function of his aggressive behaviors. When we ask parents to report what function of behavior they believe their child's disruptive behaviors are coming from, um, the majority of families report that communication is a primary function, followed by attention seeking, craving sensory input, and then escape and avoidance as being the least common. If the function of behavior is uh, to get attention, it's really important that you do two things simultaneously. One is that you do not want to pay attention to the undesirable behavior because that will increase the undesirable behavior. So whenever possible, it's important to ignore, do not call attention to the behavior and instead redirect them to do something that is more appropriate. And then once they're engaging in a desired behavior, that's the point at which they're given attention and the behavior is pointed out. It's important to both um, teach and reinforce appropriate attention seeking behaviors and be prepared for when you start to ignore an undesirable behavior that it will likely increase first before it decreases. If the function of a behavior is to escape, in this case, it's important to think about how you can take a step back and make the, give, help the individual have some success with whatever it is they're trying to escape. 
So an example here might be providing choice opportunities. Instead of um, having to do a specific thing, maybe they can choose between two things that gives them a little more autonomy and maybe um, reduces their desire to escape. Providing frequent breaks um, if it's a challenging task and teaching them how to communicate that they need a break through AAC. And then when they're engaged in appropriate behavior, after they've done something that you've asked them to do, then you can provide the escape. Some other helpful strategies that have been reported by parents include having a consistent routine, um, so keeping daily activities pretty routine, um, using a visual schedule, which can help when there are changes in routine and also help the individual understand what's coming next. The use of a visual timer can be very helpful, especially one that provides color countdowns so they can see how much time they have left or and or when an activity is going to end. Um, having them work in short durations of time, providing frequent breaks as needed, um, use of reinforcers and preferred items, that tangible um, activity that can give them um, a sense of pride and uh, help them work for the activity that they or preferred item that they're looking for. Um, some families find a lot of success with first then phrasing or first then boards. So in this example, the individual is told that first they're going to go to circle time and then they can have a snack. So providing that first then format can sometimes be very helpful for um, reducing anxiety and helping them understand expectations. And then really giving a lot of thought and planning for transitions so that the individual is not surprised um, and it's not uh, something that they um, end up in, it ends up increasing their anxiety. And then sometimes behaviors are beyond what families can handle on their own. Um, and so a behavioral specialist or uh, somebody who understands um, these these concepts of functional behavior uh, and getting them involved to help you identify what the functions might be and come up with strategies that can be useful. So that's all for me today. I just wanted to say thank you again for inviting me to speak to you all today. Uh, I've put my email here. If anybody has any questions or anything they'd like to follow up with me on, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you all again.